Hi, uh, my name's Paula from Poet Chic Emporium. Today we are going to do this so exciting project of this lovely monk's pew. Um, it's a table. This back comes up and over the top and doubles up as a table as well as a bench. It's also a blanket box as well, so it's a brilliant bit of furniture with loads of carving, loads of ornate stuff. We're going to have so much fun with the wax, which I think is something that everybody's been asking to learn about. So I have pre-printed some image transfer and as you can see there one's reversed so I think it will look quite well. We're going to put one on this panel because it feels like a natural panel and one on that one. So that's the image transfer process which we'll do quite minimally because I have already done a video on image transfer but I just wanted to show you what we were going to do with it. The customer that's asked me to do this has chosen Wedgwood Green, absolutely gorgeous colour and I haven't actually painted anything with this colour yet so I'm quite excited about that. In keeping with the picture, which has got a lot of sort of goldy yellow feeling in it, I'm going to use some Frenchy Frenchy gold powder and I'm going to mix it with both clear wax and with the finishing coat to show you how they work and, and I think it will bring the whole piece together and give it a nice posh glimmer. I just can't wait to show you. Okay, I'm going to put these things aside and get on with the painting. So it's important to say that before I've started, before I've got to this point, I've sugar soaked the whole of the product to get rid of any grease residue etc. I don't always use sugar soap to be honest, sometimes I've just used good old fashioned soap and water, um, fairy liquid, even baby wipes to give things a clean but today I've used sugar soap which is recommended to try to avoid as much as possible any sort of marks and bleed throughs coming through so we'll see how successful it is. Now for the paint. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous colour. So as you can see, less is more. I'm not putting it on too thick. This will help with the drying process. I'm just smoothing it out. Generally speaking, initially I'm doing it back and forth in horizontal lines. But I'm going to be working on a technique to show you creates an amazing effect with the wax. So once I've put on my initial coat like that, I'm going to start mixing it up a bit, using the brush to make different lines, higgledy-piggledy. Okay, and then when I go on to do the second coat, I shall be doing the same. It doesn't look much at the moment, but when we get to the wax stage, you'll see the reason for it. So, no rhyme or reason, just higgledy piggledy. I'll come back to you when I finish painting the whole piece in the same way. Right, so we've painted all of it. We've taken the back off um, so for it to make it easier to paint. And as you can see, there's crisscrossy patches all over it, which is exactly what I wanted. I've managed to get paint all over my trousers, all over my dog's nose, bless him. This is why he's called Chalky. And um, what we've discovered, and you often don't discover it until this stage, is that some bleeding is coming through in, in some areas, not all over, um, but here in particular, and I don't know if you can see it with the camera, we're going to try, there's a very tiny bit of blotchiness coming through. It would be really easy to think, oh, another coat of paint will cover that, but it won't. In fact, it will get worse and worse with every coat that you can do. So, solutions to this problem. Over the years I've tried all sorts. It particularly shows up in this particular problem with um, lighter colour paints. So one solution is to put a dark colour paint on. Um, that will completely cover it and you don't need to do anything else. So you could do that. Um, interestingly, in the past I've put a dark grey on, for example, to cover it. And then thought, right, now it's completely covered. I'll put my white that I actually wanted on top of the grey. It immediately came through. So get that so that doesn't work so a dark colour definitely does but at this stage I know this is going to be a problem and that's just from years of practicing and trialing and erroring so today to fix this problem because I know this is going to continue to be a light piece of furniture we're going to use this amazing stuff called Frenchy finishing coat um, you can use other products there are some out there um, I've used shellac in the past uh, which some of you may have heard of um, it's great it does the job it works but it 
smells disgusting, it's bright yellow and it takes absolutely hours to dry and I've had some problems if it isn't completely dry trying to paint over the top of it it starts getting all lumpy and bumpy and horrible. This stuff does not do any of those things, it's amazing and it will solve it. Now you could choose to paint your whole piece of furniture with this stuff before you even start painting. Um, I find that's a bit of a waste of uh, the finishing coat unless you, you sort of clear that it's already got ring stain marks all over it for example. If you bought a sideboard that had lots of old tea stains on it and so on I would definitely put a couple of coats of this on before I even started painting. But in this case this piece of furniture looked perfectly fine. Uh, it certainly doesn't need finishing coat all over it at this stage but there are certain patchy areas um, around it that I'm going to treat at this stage. So all I've done is pour it into a little pot and I'm going to just brush over the area that's patchy. Okay, simple as that. I've then got to let it dry. I'm going to be using my trusty hairdryer to speed the process up, but I want it properly dry, not just sort of a little bit tacky, properly dry. And then I'm going to do a second coat and do the same again, properly dry it. And then I'll be ready to carry on with my second coat of painting. So at that point, the second coat of painting is going to consist of more of the same, lots of brush strokes going in different directions. Um, and then we'll come back to you at the end of that stage. So second coat finished, crisscrossed and finishing coat treated and then you'll see that the staining that we can see here now will have disappeared. Okay. Right, I was going to come back to you when we were at the next stage of having painted another coat but I wanted to show you this because I thought it was quite a valuable education for you. We've put two coats of finishing coat on it and thoroughly dried it and as you can see it actually looks almost as if it's got worse not better and um, so I just wanted to show you it so that you can expect that and not think it's suddenly being ruined um, I'm hoping it will be enough once we cover it to um, completely obliterate any of the bleeding but that is sometimes what happens it actually looks like it's getting worse um, I did want to talk a little bit more about this bleeding problem because it is a huge problem and you can never predict when it's going to happen. It happens on all kinds of wood, all kinds of furniture and then the next bit of furniture you get, absolutely fine, not a single bit of bleeding on it. It's nothing you've done, it's not because you haven't cleaned it properly, um, it's not anything that you could do to predict and quite often you can't even tell it's going to be a problem until you've started painting. So. I find pine actually one of the worst culprits, um, but it's literally the problem of old varnish, old everything gradually seeping through once you've ignited it with paint. Um, on very rare occasions this procedure doesn't work and you need to adapt your project. And it is rare and I've been painting a long time so it's, it's one in a hundred projects this finishing coat, sealing off the bleeding. Um, isn't 100% effective and in that case I've used um, stippling which I've shown in other videos I've used different wax techniques to blend it in and to to hide it a bit better and I've used dry brushing as well which is another technique which we'll cover in another video um, which easy, easily breaks up the bleeding that comes through it and can hide it so it's, it's not the end of the world if you happen to be so unlucky that you've got one of those pieces of furniture because we've all been there. Okay, right, so we're all finished. We've done about three and a bit coats to make sure it's um, properly, properly covered. All of the staining that we're showing has gone away. It's looking brilliant. Haven't done quite so many coats on these intersections here because I know I'm going to be putting the um, reverse transfer. Excuse me, that's my dog. There we go. So, what we're going to do, it's a daily occurrence, chalky interfering with my practice, is use some finishing coat. We've, I've run through this on a previous video, so if you want this in more detail, check into my um, Facebook business page, Fairy Chic Emporium, and click videos. You will find the video on image transfer there in much more detail. So I'm going to do this quickly for you today, but not in as much detail as before. So all I'm doing is putting a layer of finishing coat on my picture letting that soak in a bit and then I'm going to do another layer on the surface I want to stick it to 
so as you can see I'm being quite random with it I'm not worrying about the odd drip here and there it won't affect anything it's all going to dry matte it's not an exact brushed piece size either that doesn't matter so I'm just getting it all nice and evenly wet so while it's wet I don't want this to dry so it won't work chalky not helping come and lie on me I'm now going to get my image which I can see is already soaking in a bit so I'm going to just quickly put some more on the image area And then I'm going to put an image down centrally as I can. Onto my panel. Now this image had a white border around it. It was actually quite helpful because it's often quite difficult to get the white border off. But it, um, because of this whole area around it, on this picture I will be able to blend it back in using the base colour so for that reason I chose not to cut off the white border because that will be the area that I'll be blending rather than onto the picture so I don't lose the image so I'm now rubbing down you can use a card for this I've used a card for this in the video or you can use your fingers like I'm doing but as it's getting wet just like wallpaper it's bubbling and I want to make sure that it's rubbed down in all areas so I'm going to go ahead and finish smoothing this out and it will take a little while and then I'm going to put the other one on there and we shall possibly leave this one overnight to dry before we go on to the next stage so pop back in a bit Right, so we've got both of our image transfers in situ. We're going to leave those overnight. I could do it with a hairdryer, but I'm not going to today because we've had quite a lot on today. So I'm going to leave those overnight. So the last job of today is sand sandpaper. Some people like stuff really shabby. Some people like it less shabby. This particular lady, I think, would prefer it not too shabby. So I'm going to do some distressing because it will add some texture and some interest to the piece, but I'm not going to go crazy with it today. There's lots of different sandpapers out there. Everyone asks what grit, um, that's what they're called, different grits. And basically the rule of thumb is the higher the number grit, the softer, smoother, finer it is. So the higher the number, the, the later it's in stages is when you would use it. So you would start with something quite coarse. So I would say around 80 grit to 100 grit to get off any um, bumps, lumps, bits that you've sort of don't want there at all that they would easily take it off and then you'll be gradually working towards the higher number grit to give you a lovely nice smooth finish and I also have this kind of spongy sandpaper which comes in all the different grits exactly the same but it's absolutely brilliant for curves because you can get a nice it bends with it and it especially for areas like this and chair legs you can wear away now this is actually quite a fine grit so this is a 220 and this is really what i would use at the end when i've done all the distressing that i want you can see it's starting to come off but i would have to work quite hard and take much longer to get more and more off whether whereas if i used a lower number grit 120 comes off really quite quickly so for distressing do you want distressing? For distressing, I'm going to very happily use 120 grit because it's quick, it's effective, it will give me what I want in terms of just a little bit of picking up the lovely dark oak that is underneath. With sanding, you tend to pick out the areas that stick up, the natural areas of wear and tear, like the corners, the edges. So but that doesn't mean that you can't sand a bit there if you like it really shabby. But for this, I'm going to be doing lots of my lovely waxing technique on this. And I think that having an extra colour 
thrown into the mix will really bring it up and look lovely. Look at that. Are you as excited as I am? Right, so as you can see, I've sanded and distressed lots of the areas on the side. I didn't really want to go overboard and have big areas because I don't think that's what the customer's after. I've then gone on with the 220 grit, which is very, very fine to give the whole piece a lovely smooth finish. So we're now ready to go on to the next stage, which is remove the backing of this paper of these images we've put on. So as before, all we're using is normal water and our fingers. This has been drying overnight, so it's completely dry. And I'm literally going to be rubbing in circles. Right, we're coming to the end of removing the paper. And there's some still cloudy bits left. So I'm rubbing away and I'm just not going to get every last bit off. It's not going to happen. And as it dries, it will gradually return to looking cloudy. But that's okay, because the finishing coat is going to sort that out absolutely perfectly. So I'm going to let that dry, rub off the few fluffy bits that I've got left. I'm really pleased with the outcome of that, really excited. It just looks proper vintage, proper there, really nice images. Got a few little areas, but I think that totally works. I have to say I think that's the best image transfer that we've done in the last short period and it has to be purely down to the fact that by chance we left this one overnight to dry because that's how it suited the progress of the project and the others we blasted with a hairdryer and even though we felt they were solidly dry this felt a lot more secure rubbing a paper off felt a lot less fragile and a lot less like we were going to take half the picture out when we were rubbing it Right, so I'm going to leave these now to dry and you will see them gradually come back cloudy as I've described. So we'll leave that process and move on to the next one. Now the first thing I'm going to do in terms of the waxing, and that's what we were really focusing today on as a learning curve for you guys, is I'm going to coat this whole project in clear wax. You don't have to, the rustic wax, the white wax, the defining wax can be put on neat uh, as they are. But because we're going to show you some techniques with the Frenchine, I think it would be useful and important to put a coat of clear wax over the whole project first which will protect what I've got and then anything else that we add if we don't like it we can take it away again and I'll show you how to do that when we get to that stage so the first thing I'm going to do is use a, a normal buffing rag this is an old tea towel that's been cut up you can use a brush I personally prefer the rag um, I haven't softened it it's just room temperature What's brilliant about French Eek is there's no toxins, there's no odour, no smell. I don't have to do it in a, a room with windows wide open and all the rest of it. Um, so I'm literally going to just use my buffing rag to smooth it on. And I'm going to do that over the whole of the piece and then I'm going to leave it for about 20 minutes to settle and harden. It will soak into the piece of furniture and you don't really want to start moving on to the next stage until it's settled. So I'll come back when we've done all of that and let it settle so we can move on to the next stage. Okay? Right, I've completely clear waxed all of the unit except for the pictures because I'm going to finish in coat the pictures. As you can see as they're starting to dry they're looking a little less clear, a little more cloudy, but that's absolutely fine. The finishing coat will sort that out and I'll show you when I do it. Right, but for now, the wax is soaked in. You can feel it zapping in because it's such lovely quality oak. It's it. So now I'm going to mix up this uh, gold Frenchine. A lot of people would probably leave this piece as it is. It's absolutely gorgeous as it is. It doesn't need any more. Um, 
but I want to give it a little bit of specialness. So I'm going to use some of this gold and it's an opportunity as well to show you quantities and how we mix it and how we use it and what we can do. So I'm going to just use a knife, scrape out an amount, put it in my box, maybe just a little bit more because I've got quite a big bit of furniture there. So there's the amount. And then, it's not an exact science, so I'm literally just going to, I'd say that was half a teaspoon. Maybe just over a whole teaspoon altogether for that amount. So I want quite a strong gold colour. And I'm just going to use the knife to mash it all in together. So you want to... Now as I was trying to explain, the clear wax is the protective wax. The clear wax will completely protect your project to date underneath. So we can always get it back to that. So now I'm using this as a decorative wax over the top to add some sheen and shine. So I've mixed it all up. And I'm going to use the same kind of buffing rag put just a tiny bit on and I'm going to rub it on this I'm not going to put it everywhere I just want to make a feature of these carved areas it's going on quite strong as you can see so I'm going to rub it in polish it in and once I've buffed it in it might be harder for you to see on the camera. I don't know if the camera can be zoomed in. But it's got a lovely goldy sheen to it. I love these Frenchine powders mixed with wax because they're subtle but they're there. They definitely make a difference. And they're just so great for picking out these kinds of areas. Okay. So I'm gonna carry on and do all these carved areas. I'll just show you while I'm here what I mean about the, being able to get it back to its original state if I wanted to. And this works with any kind of additional wax that you put on after the clear wax. So if you put the dark wax on or the white wax on and then want to take some of it away, you can. Because adding more clear wax, so I'll take a new bit of my rag back to my original clear wax and it acts like a rubber it's magic so just a little bit on and I can rub there and it's like the gold frenching was never there brilliant so it gives me so much more control if I had gone straight for the gold frenching it would have looked exactly the same as that but I wouldn't have the control to be able to take it away if I didn't like it. So that's why i chosen to put clear wax on first because I know I'm going to be playing around with lots of different colours waxes now too. I have still yet to show you what we're going to do the result of the crisscrossing paintwork that we did in the beginning and why we did that. So stay tuned. I'm going to finish the frenchining of all of the carved areas so you'll get it. I think you can possibly see with the camera it's already toning in just slightly with the, the goldiness that's on these pictures. It looks great. So I'm just going to do those two areas there a little bit maybe in the carving areas there and then we'll go on to the next stage. So Right, 
now we're on to the next stage which is using rustic French heat wax and I'm going to show you why we went to all the trouble of all the crisscrossing when we were painting. To look at it you actually can barely see any pattern at all on it um, but you will once we've finished with the rustic and the clear. So what I'm going to do is apply some of the rustic wax. Again, this rustic wax can be used directly onto a piece of furniture if that's the look you want. But we wanted to protect our original coat and I wanted to show you what you can do with wax playing around with it. This is the exciting bit. So you get to play and decide whether you like it or not, change it, pull it back, put more. This is the bit, this is the bit that I love. Once we get past the painting and the plain colour, we now get to play. So, even now you can start seeing some of the brush marks that have been left on that patch. But if I get some clear wax, um, like on my other rag, I can not only remove it, but what happens is you remove the top layer of the rustic wax, but the deep layer of the rustic wax that has gone into the brush marks stays there so you get more of a texture. Now this is very subtle, this wax. So I've taken some of it off. I could take all of it off if I wanted and just have it in certain areas. So what I'm going to do is carry on playing around with the rustic wax and often I let it settle and then I add some more. And if I decide a corner needs to be a bit darker, I'll add some more. Then I decide a bit needs to be a bit lighter, so I add a bit of clear and so on. And I'm going to go over the whole of the piece, adding this technique, rubbing it in, adding more taking it away until I'm happy with the finished look. So I let the dark wax sit into the grooves. I'm not going to go to any trouble to try and blend that in or rub that out. I think it adds to the, to the look. Can you see here? Can you zoom in with that? Can you see the line definition? Looks fab. And that's purely created by the brushing that we did when we put the paint on. And I love it. Right, moment of truth. We've waxed, we've frenchined, we've rustic waxed, we've rubbed away. It looks amazing. Every time I look at it, I feel excited. This is the moment where I prove to you, hopefully, fingers crossed, that even though it still looks cloudy and we've taken off loads and loads of paper in lots of different layers, that the finishing coat is going to bring it back to life. So here we go. We're going to watch it in action. Yeah, it's coming back nicely. I shall probably give this a second coat once it's dried just to make sure it's completely protected. Everywhere else has been waxed so that's already protected but this area I left for the finishing coat. Look at that, stunning. 
just the right amount of vintageiness, which I actually think is in the original picture. Right, should do the other one. And this one is actually for some reason more cloudy, so let's see what happens. when you put water on this won't fade when it dries right all I've got to do now is wait for the finishing coat to dry and I don't want to touch the areas around it until it has and the last stage of this once everything is settled and and dried properly is use um, I use a buffing rag, you can use an exfoliating glove, you can use a bit of tea towel, uh, whatever's your personal preference, to finally buff up your beautiful piece of furniture and I do nice vigorous circle movements and it brings the piece up to a lovely sheen and shine, fully protected and ready for use. So I'm going to carry on and do the rest of this piece um, but that was just to show you what I'm going to need to do so thank you for watching um, really appreciate the support that you give me please follow my page and like it it's www.facebook.com forward slash the Emporium Furniture which will take you straight to Fairy Chic Emporium thank you so much till the next one Your fallen tears have called to me, so here comes my sweet remedy.